Melissa, are you there? I hear some typing. I've lost your voice. Yes, please try speaking. Let's see if we can get her. She's not hearing me for some reason. Jim, I I can't hear you anymore. Um, I I was getting really delayed. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm getting really delayed voice. I don't know if people are hearing that from me as well. I didn't talk. Can I get confirmation from people that they can hear me okay? Okay, maybe through um, uh, the notes that you can write. Okay. All right, as long as everybody can hear me, then I will um, I will go ahead and go and hope for the best. Um, so my name is Melissa Miner. Um, I. I live in Bellingham, Washington, but I work at UC Santa Cruz remotely, and I work on a long-term monitoring project, um, the acronym for which is MARINE, which stands for Multi-Agency Rocky Intertidal Network. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but, um, but basically what we do is we monitor a bunch of different uh, intertidal organisms along the coast. And sea stars are one of those um, those things. In particular, the ochre star Pisaster ochreaceus. And so that's how I got involved with um, with the uh, sea star wasting syndrome work. And I I think I'm going to leave this open just in case. I, I don't know um, what you guys are seeing on my screen. If you're seeing this this box or just the uh, just the um, the PowerPoint presentation, but I just want to make sure that if something happens with the sound, I can see these notes. Oh, <laughs> I hear Jim typing. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay, so let's go ahead. Nope. There we go. Okay, so C star wasting syndrome is um, it's basically a general description of, um, of a set of symptoms that are found in many species of sea stars. And we've seen this in the past, so historically we've seen it in other species of echinoderms as well. Typically we see lesions appear, um, and these lesions can kind of grow together and cause general tissue decay, and, um, and then can lead to eventual arm loss and, and sometimes lead to death as well. Um, in the, a, a recent sea star wasting workshop that a bunch of us who are working on this issue attended, there were some pathologists who suggested that sea star melting syndrome might be a better name. And that's because of the way that the disease often expresses itself. So um, you can often have populations that are doing just fine. For, for months and months, maybe you see a low level of disease, and then all of a sudden animals start dying rapidly, and this can happen um, within a matter of days where you have everybody looking pretty good to massive um, death. And so the, the idea is that the disease isn't really a, a wasting disease in the way that we think of that. With things aren't um, aren't gradually emaciating. It's um, it can happen very quickly. Um, and I'll talk about this last point later on. But um, at this point, the cause is unknown, and so there's no way to test for the presence. So um, as I said, sometimes we have these kind of low levels of what we think are diseased animals at sites. And this is something that um, I was talking to Jim earlier about the fact that we work with a group in Sitka, Alaska. And we have seen low levels of diseased animals for, um, for about a year now, but just in the last few weeks, um, it's almost like a, a switch has been flipped, and there are large numbers of, um, of sea stars dying now, at least the, the last that I heard about a week ago. All right, um, so I mentioned that there have been previous wasting events. Um, this particular event is very different from prior events. Uh, number one, because it's not associated with a um, 
with, with warm water. There seems to be a warm water component in some places where we're seeing it. So this, um, this idea that there's sort of this switch that flips and, uh, and we get large numbers of animals dying does seem to be timed with warm water in some places, but not everywhere. And we've also seen the disease continue through colder water months. So um, actually in Southern California, the, the time period over this past year where we are seeing populations really get hit hard was over the winter. And this has never happened before. The, um, the previous events have always wound down about November when, um, when water temperatures were getting cooler. So that's led some people to think that this might be something different than, than what we've seen in the past. Um, and some people have given it the term cold water wasting. So there's, there's people looking at, um, at potential similarities. The, the issue is that these previous events, there was never a smoking gun identified for those either. And so we don't really have a way to, to know for sure whether these are the, the same, do the same um, uh, pathogen or environmental factor or, um, or whether they really are different. The other big difference between this event and previous events is that the geographic extent is much, much broader than we've ever seen before. The majority of prior events were confined to Southern California. Sometimes they reached as far north as Monterey. Um, and then there were isolated events further north. I know there was one on Vancouver Island several years ago, um, but never have we seen anything on this scale. And this. Um, if you haven't looked at our website, seastarwasting.org, this is a map of, um, of what we know to be the distribution of, the, of wasting syndrome for this event. So all of these bubbles represent either sites where we have long-term data or other researchers have sent us their information, um, or we've received information from the general public. And that's been a really big, um, a, a really big uh, source of information for this event. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But our, I just want to point out our northernmost observation, and this is confirmed from, um, from photographs that we've received from, um, from the person who submitted the observations, and they're consistent with what we're seeing elsewhere. That's from uh, the Kenai Peninsula up in Alaska, so up right where you guys are. And then the southernmost observation is down right across the Mexico border. Um, all of these gray bubbles are observations from 2013, so after data are, um, you know, are several months old, then we gray them out because we don't feel like they're they give us good current information anymore. This is where a lot of this information has come from. This is what we call our observation logs, so people can, um, can submit observations about uh, species of sea stars that either appear to be affected by the disease or, um, or look perfectly healthy. And then we get information about the site, um, whether it's intertidal or subtidal, a rocky site, a sandy site. Um, oh, I was thinking that was the, the next slide. Well, I'll, I'll show um, a couple slides from now the sort of information that you can get about these sites. But as I mentioned, this has been a great source of information for us in trying to um, figure out where the disease is spreading to and how it's spreading and when it's affecting various areas. So just to demonstrate um, how this has helped us, this map here is showing our long-term sites. This is where we have um, established long-term monitoring sites where, as I mentioned, we target um, certain species, sea stars being one of those species. And uh, you can see we have pretty good coverage. This is just using it, Washington as, as an example. Um, good coverage along the Olympic coast. And then just a few sites up this region here is called the Salish Sea, all this kind of inner coastal water, including Puget Sound. Um, so just a, a handful of sites. If we look at the information from the observation logs, you can see that now we have really great information about 
um, what the disease is doing and what species are being affected. If you click on one of these bubbles, you get, as I mentioned, information about the sites, um, when the site was last visited, who made the observation, and then which species were either affected or not affected. Uh, one of the things that we're doing with this information is putting it into a, um, a model. This, is, this work's being done by Monica Morich, who's a graduate student in the lab that I work in, uh, and Jeff Maynard, who's a um, postdoc at Cornell. And they're taking this information about where um, the disease has spread, when it got there, the severity of the impact, and um, and then overlaying all this environmental information, so um, temperature data and um, distance to nearest discharge is so sort of a proxy for pollution, um, wave climate currents, so lots of information to look for correlations between when we saw the disease hit certain areas and, and how severe it was and a lot of these environmental factors. So um, I haven't, I, I don't know where they're at with this. I'm going to see Monica next week, and um, hopefully they're starting to see some patterns that might help us understand this a little bit better. Okay, so um, I'm going to get into our field research a little bit now and, and talk about some of the patterns we've been seeing. And um, I've sort of talked about this already. Maybe I should have put it at the beginning, but... Um, as I mentioned, I work with this group, the Multi-Agency Rocky Intertidal Network, um, and we are basically a, um, a consortium of lots of different agencies. The National Park Service is, um, is one of the, the marine members, and then there's universities and other organizations, and we've all agreed to do monitoring of marine organisms using the same methods. So this coordinated network was really important for the early detection and documentation of the spread of the disease. Olympic National Park was actually the first group to um, to detect the disease at their sites. Um, to my knowledge, they were the first. It was the first first place, the Olympic National Park was the first place where the disease was detected anywhere for this particular event. And they were able to alert the rest of us within this network um, about what they were seeing, and we all agreed to start looking for, um, for evidence of the disease and documenting it in the same way. And we were able to take these methods and, um, and adapt them for citizen science groups. So we actually have a number of groups now who are collecting the same um, type of data at sites where they've committed to, um, to doing these long-term surveys in areas where, where we don't have good representation. So this is what a typical sea star monitoring plot looks like. Um, at an, and we are a rocky intertidal network, so we really do focus on rocky bench habitat. Uh, we typically have three of these plots that are um, the, the boundaries are um, marked with uh, permanent bolts that we install in the rock, and then we count and measure every uh, Pisaster acraceus that we find within those plots. Other species we count, but um, we typically don't find as many other species. Uh, Pisaster acraceus is the, the major player on the open coast. At some of these, uh, these new citizen science sites that are in inland waters, we are collecting the same sort of information for the modeled star um, Evisterius because that's the, the dominant species in those areas. But basically getting a radius estimate, so the distance from the center of the star to the tip of the longest or straightest arm, um, and that's in, uh, in increments of 10 millimeters, so um, somewhat of a size estimate. And then uh, we have disease categories 0 through 4 that, um, that we've uh, defined based on how sick a sea star is. So 0 is healthy, 4 is nearly dead. And then the citizen science effort um, is, uh, is a little different in that most of these groups don't have the ability to um, to use these 
permanent markers like we do they don't have the equipment to install it and really it's not even necessary in a lot of the places where they're looking so things like pier pilings or isolated boulders on um, you know, on the shoreline make for really great permanent plots and this has been an easy way to adapt our methods for, um, for the citizen science effort. Okay, so I'm going to show some of the long-term trends we've seen, um, but first I wanted to, and I'm going to show you on a large spatial scale, but I wanted to give some examples of what I mean when I'm talking about decline, which will be shown in, um, in red. So this is a site we actually have um, 10 more years of data, but I just am showing the most recent data for these sites. Uh, but you can see that sea stars kind of, the Pisacetocraceous numbers kind of bounce around. That's, that's pretty typical for, um, for a long-term trend where you see these ups and downs. But in these most recent samples, a lot of our sites, we've seen these major declines. And so that's, that's what I'm talking about, where we have this kind of normal variation. Um, and if we compare that mean over time to what we're seeing recently, um, that's defined as a decline in, um, in the next slide that I'll show you. And then we have a few other areas, not, not as common, but some areas where we have that kind of natural variation. And um, the most recent samples don't show major decline or, um, or really, in some cases, not much change at all. And uh, so these are the sites that are going to be shown in, um, in kind of the yellowish hues. So these are our long-term data for, um, so this is showing sites where we have data for at least four years. Um, so we're able to get some idea of the, the long-term mean and, um, and then compare that against what, uh, what we saw at our most recent sample. And you can see that for the most part, we've got yellow or, sorry, red or orange dots all the way along the coast throughout most of California um, into Oregon and then this is up in Bellingham where I am. Um, there are a few places and these are places that are really interesting to us as to why there's um, there's not as much impact. So there's this area in southern Oregon and northern California where um, a few of our sites have not been impacted as heavily as, as surrounding areas. Um, I want to stress that this is as of our last sample date. So this could have changed since we were last there in the summer. Um, but as of that last sample date, this area was still looking pretty good. The Olympic Coast was really an interesting spot in my mind um, because it was the first place where we had detected the disease and it was also one of the few areas along the coast where we weren't seeing major impacts. I think that's changed as of um, about a week ago. The, um, the Olympic Coast group was out there um, a week or two ago and started to see much larger numbers of affected animals. Um, so it's, it's possible that when we go back um, the next time and do these counts that, that these sites will show uh, major declines as well. Um, let's see. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to point out was just the, the really kind of um, disjunct distribution um, in terms of how this disease has cropped up in areas on a temporal scale. So, as I mentioned, um, Olympic Coast was the first place in June 2013 where we saw the disease. We saw it on a very minor scale um, in fall 2013 in, in some of these northern areas, but we didn't see a major decline until a full year later, so this past June um, in, in these, at most of these intercoastal uh, sites in Washington. Um, another interesting pattern that we saw temporally is that there was this, um, you know, this 
initial uh, observation in Washington. And then the next place where we observed it, and, and, at, and at the same time, well, a couple of months later, um, there were die-offs reported around Seattle and then up in Vancouver. So there, there were these kind of isolated events in Washington. But then the next big place where we saw it emerge was down in Monterey Bay in fall of 2013. So it kind of skipped all of the Oregon coast and, and popped up down here and then seemed to kind of spread down into Southern California. And then, as I mentioned, it wasn't until this past uh, spring, kind of late spring, that we saw it hit areas that it sort of bypassed um, in that first first round of decline uh, back in 2013. And we also saw it emerge on the Oregon coast. So the pattern of spread doesn't really fit with a, um, a, a pathogen that's spreading necessarily. You'd expect a nice north to south progression or south to north progression, and that really isn't what we've seen. And I wanted to uh, to just focus in on um, California really quick to illustrate that almost everywhere we've seen, oh, and one thing I forgot to mention as well, sorry, this is the problem with not being able to ask questions, the size of these bubbles represents the mean size of the population over the long term. So the bigger the bubble, the larger the, um, the sea star population was at each of these sites. So you can see that there really isn't a correlation between sea star density and, um, and disease. And that's kind of important, too, because in a lot of disease epidemics, the density of animals is an important factor, and, and that's not really what we're seeing. Okay, so the only thing I want to point out on this slide is this one green dot here. So everything else is either red or orange. Um, but there's this one spot, and this is right at Long Marine Lab, which is the marine lab associated with UC Santa Cruz. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. All right, so I've mostly been focusing on Pisaster acratius, which is the species in the upper right. There are lots of, um, of asteroid species, so sea star species, that have been affected during this event. The sunflower star is one that's gotten a lot of attention. It's in the, the upper left. And that's one that um, that is typically the first species to be hit. Um, so this is the one that we heard a lot about in uh, Seattle, in the Seattle area in fall 2013, and also Vancouver. And that's the one that they're seeing die in big numbers right now in Sitka. So, so that's usually the, the first one that we see um, to go. And then there's um, some other species. These, are, these have all been pretty well documented to have high mortality in this event. Um, the giant pink star, um, Solaster dawsoni in the lower right there is one that actually eats other sea stars, which isn't such a good thing to do when they're, they're all dying of disease. Um, and then the mottled star has experienced high, uh, high mortality in some areas, but it does seem to be a little more patchy. I've definitely been hearing about populations um, within the region where I'm at that seem to still be doing okay. The, um, the six-arm star in the middle top there, this is one that I want to talk about, give, give a little bit more attention to, because this is one that we are pretty concerned about. Um, all of these other species are broadcast spawners, so they release their babies into the water, they float around, and um, that means that if there are healthy populations, or at least, um, you know, numbers that are high enough to, um, to produce uh, babies that, that can re then recolonize areas that have been impacted by the disease, there's, um, you know, there's a good chance that we will see recovery happen um, at some point. That, that may take a long time since this disease has impacted so many animals over such a large region, but it is um, you know, it's definitely in the realm of possibilities that, that we'll see this natural recruitment and recovery. For the leptisterius, it's a brooder, which means that it holds its babies. Um, 
you know, the adults hold the babies until they're ready to crawl away, and all these little specks in that lower right uh, picture are tiny, tiny leptosterias. And the problem with this is that if they all disappear from an area, which seems to be the case in, in some of the areas we've been monitoring, um, it's going to take a really, really long time for these guys to, to recover, if, you know, if, if ever. Um, so this, this one's of pretty high concern. It's one that we don't have good quantitative data on because typically it's been so abundant and it's a very cryptic species. Um, so those two things uh, combined make it a really difficult one to um, to count at least in those those large plots that we've that we sort of designed for the ochre star. So we could have spent days counting leptosterias in the past. We're now finding that in some areas we can't find them anymore. In places where we have kept track of them, so Sitka is a place where we didn't have as many of the other species, so we were able to count the leptosterias as well. We've seen about an 80% decline. So these guys are getting hit hard. There are lots of other species that we know uh, are affected. We don't have as good of quantitative data on these species, but um, the giant star on the right, the leather star in the upper right, the blood star in the middle, and the rainbow star in the lower left are all species that um, that have been affected by the disease. The bat star in the upper left is an interesting one because for a long time in places where we'd seen the disease kind of move through various species, this one was actually feeding on decomposing corpses of other species and seemed to be doing just fine up until recently. And um, so it seems like rather than not being affected by the disease, it has somewhat of a delayed effect. And then there are lots of other species that we're pretty certain are affected by the disease, but we just don't have good information about them, um, largely because they are in the subtitle and tend to be um, less common or in habitats where people don't dive as much. But we're up to about 20 species now that that we're pretty certain are affected. Okay, so I, I sort of um, touched on the fact that that sunflower stars are the typically the first species to be hit. That's Pycnopodia in this table, um, and that there is potentially this delayed response um, in some species. And we kind of observed this firsthand. This is at Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey, where uh, Pete Ramondi, who's the person that I work for, was teaching a subtitle class in fall of 2013, so fall of last year. And so he and his students were in the water twice a week, every week from the beginning of October until um, December, through December. And um, they were kind of looking out for the disease. We, we knew, um, you know, that, that it was occurring up in Washington, Washington, but frankly didn't really expect to see it along the whole coast. And, um, and when they first got in the water, everybody looked healthy, all these different species. But after about a week, they started to see signs of disease in, um, in the sunflower stars. And this, um, the disease, uh, cropped up in, um, you know, at kind of a uh, delayed interval for a number of other species. So the rainbow stars started to go about a week after the sunflower stars, then the giant pink stars about a week after those guys, um, and then the giant stars about four weeks into the class. And all this time, so this is a really highly visited area. This is the marine lab right here. There's always uh, people out looking in the intertidal. And we weren't seeing any evidence of disease in the intertidal when um, these observations of sick animals were occurring in the subtitle. And this is something in places where we've had these paired, um, these paired observations in the intertidal and subtitle. This seems to be 
kind of typical that the subtitle is hit first. And um, you can see that it was about three weeks after the first observations of sick sunflower stars were seen in the subtitle that the first ochre star, um, the first sick ochre star was observed in the intertitle. Um, and this, this could potentially be explained by, by a couple things. Um, one is that maybe whatever's causing the disease is present in the water, and so if you're in the water all the time, then you're more likely to develop the disease sooner. The other thing might be that the ochre star just has a, a delayed response um, in terms of uh, showing signs of the disease compared to some of these uh, subtitle species. And then the last thing I wanted to point out is the, the bat star here. Um, those guys, as I mentioned, were healthy, healthy, healthy for a very long time, and then in June of this past, this, this past spring, um, June 2014, we started seeing sick individuals. So this has been kind of an, an interesting pattern that has, as I, as I mentioned, um, been present at a number of, um, of places where we have uh, these paired subtitle and intertitle uh, comparisons. Okay, so why do we care about uh, these sea stars dying? Um, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, um, but it's been really interesting to just hear how concerned the general public is, because um, as most of you know, I'm sure, it's, it's not normal that people are super um, interested even in what, <laughs> what, what we're doing um, in our, our research in the marine environment. And this has been um, really amazing to see just the, the public response and concern. Um, I get asked a lot why, you know, why should people care? How are sea stars important for humans? And the answer is they really aren't. We don't eat them. They aren't of any economic importance. But people just love sea stars, and so they really are an important, um, important species for people. I think that, that people just like to have them to look at when they go to the coast, and they've been a great tool to, um, to kind of help educate the, um, the general public. So it's, it's been kind of a neat experience to, to have that interaction. Um, for ecologists, of course, some of these sea star species, not all, but, but some of them are top predators in their systems. And the ochre star in particular is the basis for the, um, the keystone predator uh, concept, and this has been one of the most controversial, and um, you know, in a lot of ways, one of the most important uh, ideas in ecology. It's been applied uh, along the entire coast and, and other systems in, as well. That there is this um, this idea that top predators can control other uh, other members of their community. And so um, this idea was developed by Bob Payne at one site in Washington on Tattoosh Island. And I think this is the controversial part of the idea is that um, this idea worked in one area. Some people say that he was lucky and that uh, it was a good year for, or a good couple of years for muscle recruitment. And so it worked really well to show that when sea stars uh, are removed from a system, that the muscles move down lower in the intertidal. And so the silver lining, I think, for this disease event, um, you know, it's sad that, that sea stars are declining in so many areas, but it's going to allow us to test this hypothesis on a very large scale. We're going to be able to see whether muscles really do increase or other species. I mean, the ochre stars don't just eat mussels, but they eat barnacles and whelks and all kinds of things. And we can look for this community response um, on a large scale. And my guess is that we're going to see variation across this, this broad scale in how the community responds. <laughs>
I don't think that the inner title is going to turn into a, uh, a muscle monoculture, but, um, but it will be interesting to see. The way that we will be looking at this, we, we have what we call biodiversity surveys, and um, these are basically transects that we run through our sites and we record at, um, at equal intervals which species are under those points, and we also get uh, topographic information, so we use survey equipment to, um, to get tidal heights along these transects. So then what we end up with is a, basically a map of the intertidal, so this uh, particular one is just showing information for mussels and pisaster, but you can see where the distribution and abundance of mussels are at this site and where the distribution and abundance of pisaster are. And so the expectation is that the red dots are going to decline at a lot of our sites, and maybe we'll see mussels move down lower. This is the, the water at the, the left side of the screen and the, um, the upper intertidal and the, the cliffs or the, the upper, or sorry, the, the right side of the screen. So um, we have a, a lot of these sites where we have this information and um, we'll be able to, to see what, what the response is of the, um, of the community. And, and mussels are just one of the species that we collect information for. We have lots of different species that we can, we can look for potential response. Okay, so this is the part that um, people are usually most interested in and I know the least about, and this is the, the disease studies. Um, I can tell you what I know, what's been done so far. We, we've been collaborating with a group at Cornell um, who's been doing metagenomics work. So we, we basically send them tissue samples and they use this technique to screen for possible causative agents. So looking for things like viruses and bacteria. Um, there are, well, I'll get into the issues with that in the next slide. Um, there's another group at UC Santa Barbara who's been focusing on um, possible bacterial culprits. So in these prior wasting events, um, which were primarily in Southern California, there were bacteria, species of bacteria that were identified as potential culprits in, um, in those events. Nothing was ever definitively um, uh, decided that, that that was, you know, the, the cause of these earlier events. But because there had been this earlier work and it, and it sort of pointed toward these different species of bacteria, um, there's a group that's looking to see if those species are playing a role in this event as well. And then there's also histologists. We've been sending tissue samples to histologists as well. And they are looking at the response of the animals to, um, to the disease. They're looking for internal lesions and um, how the tissue you know, appears. And, and it's been really interesting because um, there are these, these other groups who are looking at, uh, at a potential pathogen as a cause. And they've had some evidence that you know supports both of those ideas. And then the histologists feel like there's pretty strong evidence that there's an environmental factor involved as well. Um, and that's based on the way that they're seeing the animals respond. So this really rapid melting that, um, that we often observe, the, this one histologist in particular feels like that's not something that could happen due to a virus or a bacteria, um, that there's some external factor that's, that's causing that tissue to, um, to be compromised relatively rapidly. So the, the, the issue with that is that for those of us who are working in the field, there's nothing that's matched up nicely to explain that. You know, we're not seeing um, major temperature differences in all areas that are affected or, um, or uh, acidity levels increase, ocean acidity levels increase in these areas. So there's nothing that, that matches up well with that environmental um, hypothesis. So I think that at this point, most people think that uh, 
it's probably a combination of factors. There is a paper, Ian Hewson, who's the person that we've been primarily collaborating with at uh, Cornell, um, he has a paper that should be published any day now, I think. Um, so that, that will, once that's out, then we can talk a little bit more freely about his results. But, um, but I wanted to, to talk a little bit about why it's so tricky to, you know, to figure out what the cause is. Um, this is showing a cross-section of a sea star arm. And sea stars are, they, they have um, a water vascular system and they've got their madreporite at the top that allows seawater to, um, to enter their bodies, their, this water vascular system. And it's filtered some. Um, it, it filters everything out that's above about 10 microns in size. But there's lots of stuff that makes it through, and there's lots of bacteria and viruses and all kinds of other stuff floating around in the, the seawater just naturally. So some of that gets into the animals, um, which makes it really hard to separate out what's sort of the, the what's there naturally, what's, you know, what's in the environment versus what might be making the sea star stick because there's millions of these things that they're trying to screen and look for differences between sick and healthy animals. And that's the other big issue is that we are calling the tissue samples that we're sending them sick for, for animals that are clearly diseased and then apparently healthy. Because at, at this point we sort of feel like there might not be any place along the coast anymore that hasn't been exposed to whatever's causing the disease. It, it, and, and that makes it difficult because if you don't have true healthy uh, specimens to compare against sick specimens, you, you don't have any way of looking for, um, you know, for things that are different between sick and healthy animals. Um, looking at my time here, I don't know if I'm supposed to stop at two. If I am, I should probably blast through this so we have time for questions. Um, maybe just let me know, Jim. Um, okay, and then the other uh, complicating factor is that the, um, okay, we stop at two. All right, well, I will try and wrap this up then. Um, there are differences depending on where you take your tissue sample from. So, um, so, so if you take it from the middle of the star versus a tube foot, you might get very different results in that um, using the, the metagenomic screening technique. Okay, so really we don't understand four key questions. Um, number one, what's actually causing the disease, how the disease is transmitted. If it's something that's local, why has it suddenly, um, you know, gone bad? Why is it, why are we seeing it ramp up in these systems? And if it's exotic, where did it come from and how did it spread so, um, you know, so freely along the entire coast. And then the other big question that people are really watching closely for is whether it will spread to other species. We've had isolated uh, observations of sick urchins and sea cucumbers with lesions and, um, you know, other kind of odd looking things. It's always tricky when people are looking very closely at species because there's always going to be the odd looking um, urchin or sea cucumber, because uh, echinoderms just have a few ways of expressing stress, and uh, that could be due to disease or some other um, injury, or you know, there's there's lots of different things that that could explain why um, there's tissue necrosis or lesions on an animal. So because we can't test for the disease, we really only feel confident that we're seeing wasting syndrome when large numbers of animals are dying. Um, oh, and I forgot about this part. So this is the happy part. Um, I'll go through it quickly. Uh, we have seen some encouraging signs of healing, so it doesn't seem like every time an animal contracts the disease it dies. We've seen what look like lesions that have healed and lots of animals with arms regrowing. So they drop a, um, an affected arm and then can regrow that arm back. 
We've seen lots of spawning, um, which leads to recruits. And this is that site that I was talking about that's the only green site on the coast. Um, and if you look at the number of juveniles, which I believe in this case the cutoff was um, anything smaller than 50 millimeters in radius, um, you can see that we saw very low numbers of these juveniles for years and years and years. And then in this last sample, there was this huge increase, a major decline in the adults, but a huge increase in, um, in juveniles. So this is really encouraging. It's very patchy, though. This is that site right at Santa Cruz. And then another long-term site just to the north. And if you, we look at the data, these are um, uh, sample year at the bottom, so oldest to most recent, the top. And the size of the animals are listed across the bottom. The size of the bubble is the, the number that we saw. And uh, you can see at this site just to the north, which is on the left, Scott Creek, we saw very few juveniles. And at Terrace Point, the site to the south, there was this huge um, influx. It's, um, I'm going to skip that one, it's definitely not ubiqu ubiquitous uh, out of 50 sites that we looked at for evidence of recruitment, only five had higher than normal numbers of stars. And so this is something that we want to look at is, you know, what's special about these sites. And we're asking for help from, um, from the general public to help us look for, uh, for these juveniles in areas outside of where we're normally looking at our long-term sites. We have a juvenile ID guide available on our website, and, um, and that's pretty much all I have. Uh, I just want to encourage you guys, if you haven't looked at this website, there's a lot of good information there. OK, so I think we have about five minutes for questions. Oh, eight minutes, if anybody has questions. I'm going to try speaking again. Can you hear me better now? I can, yeah. Yeah, I apologize. We have some internet issues in our office that have uh, caused that to break up, I think. But uh, so, folks, if you do have questions, type them in the question box, and I'll read them. I do have one uh, sort of question comment. It says that um, it seems like a disease slash resistance relationship. Is it possible that shallower species experience higher stress, thereby weakening their immune responses? Well, that's um, shallower species express. So there is this apparent pattern, if we look at just one species, uh, Pycnopodia, the sunflower star, where we have seen huge numbers of animals die in kind of the shallow subtitle. And obviously, we don't have as good of information from deeper waters, but I know that in places where animals have died in sh shallower waters, it's still possible to pull up healthy animals from um, like deep crab pots and stuff. Um, it's tricky to sort of jump to those conclusions because we really don't have good information for those those deeper water areas. I, um, I've been trying to get, there's, there's a group here in um, in Washington that has trawl data, or not trawl data, but uh, yeah, it is trawl data from some of these deep areas. And sea stars are one of the things that they keep track of. Um, and so that'll be really interesting to see how those numbers change over time, if at all. Uh, so it's possible that there's this deep water refuge. It's something that people have talked about in past events, that it it might not be a, um, a water, a depth thing necessarily, but maybe a temperature. The temperature is more stable there. Temperature is known to be a stressor for sea stars, so um, it's, it's definitely possible. Um, I just, you know, we just don't have enough information at this point to, to say for sure. Okay, thanks very much. I suppose if there were any, um, you know, indication of any differences just even in the inner tidal between disease levels, you know, at the higher intertidal or the lower intertidal, you would have sort of shared those with us. So I'm presuming there's not or it's not being, or is that even being looked at, any differences between the position within the intertidal? Uh, 
That would be a tricky thing to look at because there aren't really, I can't think of species that are, you know, there, there's the ochre star, um, Pisosterocratius, and then a handful of other species, the, the Leptosteries, the six-armed stars, another one that's primarily an inter intertidal star. Um, but most of the other species that you see are primarily subtidal species, okay. but you, you will see them on good low tides. So, yeah, it would be hard to, I suppose to know, and they move around so They're much. mobile anyway, yeah, so they may not be a good yeah. <laughs> example of any particular yeah. strata in the intertidal. Okay, here's another question. Um, is this being seen on the east coast uh, of the Pacific, so across the, the Pacific, or is it being seen on the east coast of the USA in the Atlantic at all? I haven't heard anything about um, any sea star disease in the, the you know, sort of Japan, Russia area. Um, there was a, an, a, I think it was just a, you know, a few month epidemic on the east coast of the United States, so on the Atlantic coast, at the same time that we were first seeing the disease emerge here. Um, I actually haven't heard what's happened with that. My my feeling, because we haven't heard a lot about it, is that it sort of disappeared. It was just, it just lasted a few months and then was gone. I know that there are people looking into whether these two events are related, um, but I haven't heard anything okay, um, definitive about that. Has anyone considered ocean acidification as either a cause or a contributing factor? Yeah, that's definitely one of the things that, that people are thinking about. Um, it's kind of tricky to to test, um, particularly in the intertidal, because we just don't have good information about pH levels. It's really hard to uh, to measure at this point. There are a few places on the coast where we have instruments out, um, but our data tend to be pretty variable um, just because of all the, you know, the, the extra things that you have to take into account in the intertidal. Um, so, yes, it is something that people are thinking about. It might be a little tricky to, um, to answer on a broad scale, but perhaps there are places where we do have data that we can, um, we can look for correlations between sea star numbers and, uh, and pH levels. Okay, and uh, another question says, what variables are being taken into consideration in the models? Yeah, so this is something, as I mentioned, I, because I don't work in Santa Cruz, I'm, I'm actually very rarely there. Um, I, haven't, I haven't had anything other than email exchanges with Monica, who's the the grad student who's putting this model together. Um, and I know this is something that she's going to talk about at the Western Society of Naturalists meeting in a couple of weeks. So hopefully I'll have more information about what they're finding um, in a couple of weeks, but I don't know at this point, um, you know, all the factors that they've, they've put in there and um, what sorts of patterns they're seeing, if any. Okay, and uh, I think we have time for one more question here. Uh, the question, yeah, we do. It says, uh, is there any evidence of recurring disease on regrown arms after a period of health? Um, that would be tricky to answer with our data. There might be um, aquariums that, that are keeping track of that. So I, I don't, that, that would be hard to address in the field. I think you would need captive animals to um, to know the answer to that just because it, it's nearly impossible to mark sea stars and it's not something that, that we do. Um, so we're not following individuals, we're following the population as a whole. I think it's encouraging that we're seeing animals regrowing arms, but it's also you know, we know that the disease is still present in a lot of these areas where we're seeing uh, 
quote unquote recovering animals. So I think it's one of these things where we just have to wait and see if, if those guys really are in the clear or if they just got lucky for a while. Okay, and is the disease limited to um, adult animals or no? Uh, or no, no. There, there is a. We are we are seeing the the population structure change in that the the larger animals are. Um, seem to be more likely to contract the disease compared to the smaller animals, but it's one of those things where we're not sure if that's really the case or if we're just seeing more small animals now because the large animals are disappearing. So you can imagine kind of two scenarios where um, either the, the juveniles are less susceptible and that's why we're seeing a higher proportion of juveniles now or the juveniles were all just squeezed back in the crevices behind the adults and so we weren't seeing them until recently. Um, and I don't know how how we would separate those um, those two possible conclusions. Um, we are seeing juveniles that are affected by the disease, so I think it's again one of those things where we're just going to have to see if if they're able to survive over the long term. Okay, and I think we'll ask we'll call this the last question. Um, Okay. Are public aquariums seeing this disease at all, and have there been differences between aquariums that use natural ocean water or those that use processed or, you know, make their own seawater? Yeah. Yeah, so I, uh, the, a lot of um, aquariums have been affected by, by the disease, and a lot of them have lost a large number of animals. Um, the ones with open water systems are are. Uh, clearly more susceptible than the ones with closed water systems, but my understanding is even in the the facilities that are making their own water, um, they have before they realize that the disease was a problem, they you know they collect their animals from the wild, and so I think in some cases there were animals introduced that um, that then introduced the the disease to other sea stars in the um, aquarium. So I, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that if there are places that have not seen any evidence of disease. It's a little tricky in these captive facilities because there's lots of things that stress sea stars out. So, and because we can't test for the disease, we can't go to a facility and say, yeah, the disease is there or it's not. Um, but hopefully in the near future we'll, um, we'll be able to test for that. All right. Well, thank you very much, Melissa. This is a very interesting uh, um, topic. Uh, sort of unfortunate for the sea stars, obviously, but uh, clearly a lot of interest in it. And uh, we thank you for sharing the information with us, folks. Uh, right. We'll probably be trying to schedule another poet webinar within the next couple of months. So keep your uh, eyes out for that. It'll come out on email to those of you on the email list. And uh, thanks for joining us today. All right. Thanks for listening.